Mason Rudolph has kind of been stuck in a quarterback purgatory the last five seasons with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, the former Cowboys had some ups, like in 2023, he started a playoff game this year. And some downs, of course, as you know, in 2019. And uh, Brooke Pryor, who covers the Pittsburgh Steelers for ESPN, is here to tell us all about it. Now, before we get into our interview with Brooke, we'll thank the sponsors who make this show possible. And that starts with two fellas movers, the National Cowboy in Western Heritage Museum, Midfirst Bank, FireLakeJobs.com, and Oklahoma Ford Dealers. We remind you to drive into your best in Oklahoma Ford Dealers today for the best deals on Ford's full lineup of trucks and SUVs. Ford is the best in Oklahoma. Now let's get to the conversation with Brooke. Hey everybody, welcome back to Two on OSU, where today Sam and I are joined by Brooke Pryor, who of course you know her from covering the Pittsburgh Steelers for ESPN.com. And uh, we're, we're talking about Mason Rudolph. Of course, that's that's the obvious connection between the Steelers and the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Brooke, you wrote an awesome story just uh, this last winter where you described Mason Rudolph getting his resume that he hadn't touched since his freshman year of college worked up because he didn't know exactly what he was going to be doing. Uh, and Mason Rudolph now, I mean, he's in a little bit of a better situation, I think, football wise than he was last summer. What's next for, for Mason Rudolph? Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy to think that Mason Rudolph really improved his standing, I think, within the whole NFL because of the way that this last season ended. And especially when you mentioned the resume that he was updating for the first time since his freshman year at Oklahoma State, he had kind of joked, like, I thought maybe I'd go into commercial real estate. And when I pointed out the joke, he said, no, that I wasn't joking. I was serious. Like, I really thought that that might happen. Um, because I mean, he'd very much been buried in the Steelers depth chart since, uh, since the 2019 season when very tumultuous roller coaster year. Um, so for him to kind of be able to, to not only get the opportunity to start late in the 2023 season, but to play really well in those final four starts, um, he's hitting the free agent market. In March, the Steelers have expressed a desire to bring him back. They also just released Mitch Trubisky, which means that, I mean, if Mason Rudolph were to come back, if he decided to re-sign in Pittsburgh, he would be one of the quarterbacks competing with Kenny Pickett for that QB1 position. Um, the Steelers obviously want things to work out with their first round draft pick, but Mason Rudolph showed them what the offense can be capable of if they have a, a serviceable quarterback beyond what they were getting out of Kenny Pickett and Mitch Trubisky. How do you gauge his reputation, Rudolph's, among Steeler fans? I, I know the saying is the backup quarterback is always the most popular player on the team. I, I don't even know with you know how the how the postseason ended, if backup or, or what even his role is. It's just so weird. But is he a folk hero? Do, do, the, do the fans want him back? Or do you think the fans want us to get out with Pickett? Yeah, you know, it's so funny, the, the whole, the backup quarterback's the most popular guy in Pittsburgh, because uh, Mason Rudolph kind of challenged that cliche for a big part of his career. I mean, after 2019 was so tumultuous, he remained on the roster, usually the number three quarterback, sometimes the number two, but he was very much an afterthought, and I think a scapegoat and the, the punchline of a lot of jokes in Pittsburgh, like, oh, well, there's a competition between Kenny Pickett and Mitch Trubisky. Oh, yeah, and I guess Mason Rudolph is there, too. Like, he was never, um, after that 19 season, never really had, um, I think, the popularity that some backups have. Um, and then this last season, because of the way he came in and played, and even before he started, uh, before he he kind of regained that starting job, people were calling for Mason Rudolph to come back in, and it was this really strange, I guess, full circle kind of moment where he was dismissed so quickly, I think, by Steelers fans to all of a sudden they're clamoring for him at the end of the season, their chance for Mason Rudolph in the stadium. It was it was a very like bizarro world upside down, but I was also really happy for him because of, you know, the everything that he had gone through since he's gotten to Pittsburgh. Um, you know, he gets drafted. Ben Roethlisberger kind of says, hey, I'm I'm going to just show you point to the playbook when you ask me for help kind of thing to 19 not going great. 
um, to then very much having this renaissance that's made him, you know, I think maybe not a hot commodity, but at least a commodity that has value when at the end of the 2022 season, it kind of felt like Mason Rudolph's time in the NFL may be over it. And he clearly thought as much too. Yeah, you mentioned the crowd chanting his name. I think it was that Cincinnati game where he he goes out and, and leads them to a win. Is this the best football Mason Rudolph's played? Is this the best, the highest his stock has been since leaving Oklahoma State? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think that he showed a confidence and a maturity in the way that he played at the end of the season that we really weren't seeing early in his career. I think the confidence is the biggest difference maker to me. Because I remember in that 19 season, he got concussed. I believe it was his first start against the Baltimore Ravens, took a really hard hit and just where it happened to land. Um, he, I believe, passed out, blacked out on the field and they had to cut hit the front of his helmet off and he's helped off the field. And after that, it felt like he was holding on to the ball just a little bit too long before each of his throws. And it just felt like there was this hesitation in his game, which is obviously understandable after you've been drilled like that, but it, it wasn't, it, it did not, I think he wasn't able to shake it off and to overcome it. And that, you know, all of the chaos is kind of compounded with the Miles Garrett incident. He is not playing well. The team isn't playing well. It just was very frustrating. Um, and this year it kind of felt like he recognized he had nothing to lose. Um, he, I think really settled into his role on the team. Um, he kind of talked about how he was the comic relief. He was like, I'm the one that's been making these quarterbacks and guys in the offensive meetings laugh. I have a good relationship with the old offensive linemen. You know, I think everybody on the Steelers roster was rooting for Mason Rudolph because he's the kind of guy that you can get behind that, you know, was a relatively high draft pick had a shot to to start after Roethlisberger gets hurt. That doesn't pan out. And then he very much was in the background for the last couple of years, but his perseverance and his hard work paid off. And he came in and looked like a much better quarterback than he had the last time he was a starter. I, I hate to, to throw out, you know, a question in a vacuum because in the NFL, I know obviously like there's no vacuums. Mason Rudolph, the Steelers want, True bit, you know, it just makes sense. They want Pickett, they want the first rounder. It, it, there's never a true vacuum. But it, now that he has a little control and where he's going, he hits free agency in March. Is Mason Rudolph good enough to be one of the 32 people on the planet with a starting job? Do you think that's what he'll be looking for? What have have you seen him be good enough to be a starter, bro? You know, I don't know if if he's good enough to be a surefire starter. I really wish we would have gotten that fifth game out of him as a starting quarterback, because that fifth, sixth game is kind of where the glass either shatters or is solidified. Um, you saw it in Joe Flacco. I mean, he was this remarkable story. He wins comeback player of the year, but he gets to the playoffs and it all falls apart down the stretch late in the game. And so with Mason Rudolph, you hope like, did we cut, did, did the Steelers, really unlock something here or did they capture lightning in a bottle kind of the way that the Eagles did with Nick Foles, right? Because Nick Foles comes in and wins a Super Bowl and then doesn't really pan out the rest of his NFL career. And so I think for Mason Rudolph, it's about finding a place where he's definitely a number two with the opportunity to compete for that starting job, someplace that doesn't have their number one locked down, but I don't see him being able to sign somewhere and being anointed like, hey, you are the clear cut number one guy. You're going to have to defend your position through training camp, but you're starting out on topic. I think wherever he goes, it's still going to be a battle, but he did prove that, hey, he's a reliable backup. Something that, I mean, last year there was a record number of quarterback injuries. They needed a really good backup quarterback. The Jets would have loved to have Mason Rudolph. The Browns, until they found Joe Flacco, would have loved to have Mason Rudolph. So I think that he did at least show that he has a lot of value as a solid number two kind of insurance policy. Brooke, has Mason Rudolph always been looked at kind of like that as a solid number two? I mean, you mentioned him coming in behind Roethlisberger, who that job is going to be locked down until Roethlisberger says, I don't want it anymore. Uh, has Mason Rudolph always kind of had that all he's ever going to be as a number two in the NFL tag? 
You know, I, I don't know if always. I think that, you know, one of the, the popular things that people in Pittsburgh love to bring up is that Kevin Colbert, the former general manager, said kind of from the beginning that they had a first round grade on Mason Rudolph when when they drafted him. They obviously drafted him after the first round, but he was on record as saying like, oh, we really think that this guy could be a starter. Um, and so I think early on, there was the talk of maybe he could eventually be a starting quarterback. Um, but I, I don't think that he was drafted necessarily with the path kind of laid out being like, this guy will be a starter. But I think that a high upside number two, maybe eventually works his way into being a number one has always kind of been his trajectory, but then it very much slipped when he got buried on the depth chart, um, just through a, just kind of a, a crappy set of circumstances is what happened to him. And so, um, he very much needed to get back on the field in more than just a preseason game. And he did that this fall and I think really took advantage of that. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, before Mason Rudolph was drafted, James Washington was drafted, the Oklahoma State receiver. A lot of people maybe looked at that as, hey, they're bringing in, you know, Washington and Rudolph, these guys together. Um, and Tomlin, I feel like he was at the pro day, I know, in Stillwater to watch those guys work out. Has it maybe felt like um, Tomlin always has had kind of Rudolph's back maybe in some areas? I mean, with, throughout the Miles Garrett incident too? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that that Mike Tomlin's a guy that, I mean, he's, he's rooting for guys that he drafts, that he brings into the franchise, into the organization. And yeah, Mason Rudolph was set up for success by also drafting James Washington, but the chemistry that they had at Oklahoma state just didn't quite translate to the NFL. And I think one of the, the moments from 2019 that sticks out in my head is uh, when Mason Rudolph got benched at the ha at halftime of the Bengals game in Cincinnati, I believe that was the week after the Miles Garrett incident. He gets benched. Duck Hodges comes in, and one of the first throws was this long touchdown to James Washington. And it was like, well, where in the world was that when Washington is playing with his college quarterback? So I think that it, just because they had that chemistry in Stillwater, somehow it didn't translate over to the NFL. But I think that Mike Tomlin very much has had Mason's back through the Miles Garrett stuff coming out pretty immediately and saying that, you know, what was being alleged by Miles Garrett, that there was a racial slur that was used was not true. Um, I mean, Rudolph's career could have tanked right then and there. He, he could have never had another shot in the NFL if the Steelers organization didn't stand behind him there. Um, and I think that also bringing him back last season to be a number three quarterback is huge because he didn't, he would not have come back to Pittsburgh if he had had another option. I think at the time that 2022 ended, he was ready to go prove that he could be a quarterback somewhere else in the league. And the rest of the league said, yeah, we really, we don't, we think we know what this is and we're not interested. Um, so yeah, he, he would have, I think had to send out that resume if Mike Tomlin hadn't reached out and kind of brought him back into the fold. Kind of an unplanned side note, but do, uh, do you know where Duck Hodges is now? To to quote Obi Wan, that that's a name I've not heard in a long time. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, Duck Hodges is you know living life in Nashville as Laney Wilson's boyfriend, Grammy winner Laney Wilson. Uh, as far as I know, he is not in the NFL. He's just kind of hanging out, uh, doing his thing away from the football field. Very much a, a football one-hit wonder. Good for him. I bet the, the duck population in, in Tennessee is lessened. Good, good for him. A hundred percent. Yeah, he's got plenty to hunt, plenty of things to do. I mean, really, I think that he was perhaps born to be like a country star's boyfriend, folk hero kind of thing. And then like, oh, by the way, he was also a Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback. So I guess as the, the calendar nears March, is it more likely Mason Rudolph, if, if we presume he's earned the biggest contract or, of his life, is it more likely the Steelers are going to be signing that contract or one of the other 31 teams? You know, at this point, I think it's kind of up in the air. Um, I'm so intrigued to see what the Steelers do, because I think that they would like to bring Mason Rudolph back. but. I don't know how Mason fits in Arthur Smith and Arthur Smith's new system. Um, I'm interested to see if Mason wants an opportunity to prove himself somewhere else because of 
kind of the the roller coaster that he's been on throughout his career in Pittsburgh when there was essentially an open quarterback competition between Pickett and Trubisky and Rudolph was supposedly supposed to be in the mix. But as we know, it was kind of, I hate to say a sham competition, but like it was pretty much known the whole time that it was going to be Trubisky, Pickett, and then Rudolph. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's a situation where the Steelers want Mason and Mason doesn't want the Steelers because he'd like to, I think, get kind of a, a bearing on what else is out there and prove that that he can be an NFL quarterback without maybe some of the politics of Pittsburgh of trying to, you know, uh, jumpstart their first round quarterback. Um, there's also, I know, plenty of rumors about the Steelers trading for Justin Fields. That would be very uncharacteristic of how the Steelers operate. Also rumors of the Steelers bringing in Ryan Tannehill would also be uncharacteristic, but maybe a little bit more realistic with Arthur Smith being there. So I feel like the Steelers, I think, are going to look at some of some other outside options while also trying to evaluate what Mason Rudolph wants to do. But at this point, if I'm betting on the Steelers or the field for where Mason Rudolph ends up, I think it's going to end up being the field. If you were an NFL GM, Brooke, what kind of deal would you sign Mason Rudolph to? From my understanding, he... Uh, he's he's been on a a series of one year deals the last couple of deals. I mean, is it is it going to be multi year? What 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 do you think is fair? You know, I think maybe I'd give him something similar to what the Steelers gave Mitch Trubisky initially before they extended him last year. Um, I think that was two years, fourteen million ish, um, somewhere in that range, ten ten to eighteen, two years, um, something that doesn't necessarily have a ton of guaranteed money, maybe some upside with incentives, but something where there's a clear we can cut bait after the second year if we need to kind of thing. Because yes, he did prove that he is a better quarterback than he was in 2019. But like I said, the sample size still felt so small that you you don't want to commit a ton of resources and cap to Mason Rudolph when you're not entirely sure what you're getting there. And you kind of got into this. I mean I think folks in Stillwater would be perfectly happy to see Mason Rudolph get a fresh start, a new offense, a different team, to just kind of see what he can do, right? Is it a case of, hey, we we know what Mason Rudolph in Pittsburgh looks like. Let's see something else. Yeah, 100%. I mean, if you're Mason Rudolph, I think that you're probably frustrated that you, A, didn't get a shot when you thought you should have, or you didn't get a shot earlier, and you've also just been stuck in this stagnant offense that can't seem to get itself going. I mean, it's taken over half a season the last couple of years to get the run game going, to get the offensive line to gel. You've also got receivers that some weeks they're, you know, plays where they're not going after a loose ball on the ground. There's others where they're frustrated they're not getting the ball. There's a lot of personalities to manage. Um, And in some cases, the Steelers offense is very safe, very, um, you know, predicated on quick throws and running the ball. And if you're Mason Rudolph and you've got this arm, you'd probably like to be able to use it a little bit more often than just a case of, well, we want to keep a defense on us, so we'll bomb the ball a couple times a game to just stretch out the field a little bit more. Um, I mean, I think that arm strength is one of his huge upsides that he didn't get to use a ton. Obviously, he did in those last four games, got to show it off a little bit more and had more success with it than Pickett and Trubisky had. But go to an offense where they are throwing the ball more, where it's not going to be a run first offense the way that Pittsburgh's going to be, even as the league is moving toward this era of superstar quarterbacks and running the offense through them. Um, I don't know that, you know, he's going to then become Patrick Mahomes by any means. I don't think that's going to happen. But Shoot, yeah, I mean, I, I think give him a chance to to try something else to kind of showcase himself more to be maybe more than a game manager, just more than somebody that's better than Kenny Pickett. The last question I have for you, Brooke, is something you mentioned on a, a little earlier about Rudolph making the the, the older guys laugh and in, in the QB room just being uh, being a positive presence there. Uh, I guess assigned to the good work that that you do of providing readers with the the details you can't get by you know watching CBS or every one PM, but is is that has <clears throat> has that been your uh, y- your opinion of, of Rudolph that he is one of those positive guys 
in everything not on the field, just intangibles wise? Is he? I, I assume that makes it easier to to bring in, especially to be a backup, bring in somewhere else and fit right in. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, and it's funny because I think early in his career he wasn't that necessarily. I think early on he was pretty straight laced. I mean, he's always been very serious and very businesslike in his approach. I mean, he's got a really great work ethic. I remember seeing him go out on the field, even when he knew he wasn't playing early on and go through warmups as if he was going to start. He'd be, he'd wear his helmet on the sideline. I mean, this is a guy that is fully locked in, but I think the longer he was in Pittsburgh and the more he was kind of in the background, the more that he kind of let his personality show a little bit more that he was goofier. He was um, kind of funny and sarcastic. And like he would text Derek Watt when he saw that TJ Watt had parked his car next to the median in the parking lot instead of in an actual dedicated space, mostly because parking there is really tough. And so sometimes TJ was like, well, I have nowhere else to put my car. I'm going to go right here. Mason would take a picture of it and text it to Derek and say, wow, the guy signs one big contract. And now he thinks that like he can park wherever he wants. Things like that. I mean, he went down to Alville and a wave of former Steelers offensive linemen went down to Al's fruit farm during the bye week this last year and was hanging out with the guys, but then also did a photo shoot where he was in a pair of overalls that were left over from a Halloween costume posing with, uh, I think it was a jackfruit also in front of an old car shirtless in the overalls, just because like he thought it would be a funny bit. So I think that he is a really good locker room guy. And that's, you know, I think that he always had that in him, but I think now he's able to take himself less seriously. And that's some, that's the type of guy that you would want to add to a locker room. Now, before you were ever in, you know, Pittsburgh, you were in Oklahoma covering the Oklahoma Sooners. You got to see two, I think, right, pretty good Bedlam games. Have you ever brought those up to Mason? I mean, Maybe a bit of a sore subject for him. What what does he think about uh, Bedlam in, in those days that you guys, I guess, kind of shared a little bit? Yeah, we, you know, it's been a long time since we've talked about it. But definitely when I got here in 2019, which is crazy that that's been like five years ago now. Um, but yeah, I was, I covered OU when Baker Mayfield was the quarterback. And so he's good friends with Baker. Um, we have a lot of mutual friends, kind of know some of the same people. And so, yeah, we would kind of talk and laugh about it. Um, talk a little bit about just Oklahoma State and the connections that he has still with Gundy and everybody else there. Um, I talked with him earlier this year. I think he went up and had, was it maybe not his jersey retired, but it was honored um, something. He went back up to Stillwater. And so we caught up about that. Um, that's, I think, one of the coolest things about coming from covering colleges in Oklahoma and then now being in Pittsburgh is that there are guys that have these Oklahoma connections. I mean, Jalen Warren is there now. I had James Washington for a little bit. Um, and so they're guys that you're always looking for a way to connect with them to, you know, maybe they'll remember my name, if not my face. Um, and we can talk about things other than just what's going on in Pittsburgh. So it's been really cool to, to have them. And, you know, I, while I said, you know, it seems like Mason's going to end up somewhere other than Pittsburgh, um, I will be very sad because I always enjoyed talking with him and he was always really candid and um, I think very genuine. And the way that he talked with the media took time and didn't, you know, he would give coach speak when he had to when he was on the podium, but he was also off to the side a really great interview and just, I think, a good all around person. Yeah. And maybe one day he'll get out of this kind of quarterback purgatory he's been living in for the last five years. It just felt like he can't quite ever shake it. Maybe now is his time to shake it. Here's to hoping. Brooke Pryor, thanks so much for joining us. Everyone, be sure to check out uh, all of her great work for ESPN covering the Steelers. You can you know, read more about James Washington, Jalen Warren, all these former Cowboys that somehow keep ending up in Pittsburgh. Thanks so much for joining us, Brooke. Thanks again to Brooke Pryor of ESPN for joining us today on Two on OSU. If you like what you heard, if you like Oklahoma State talk, we're one of the only podcasts doing it. So it help us out. Be sure to like it. Subscribe to it. Uh, another thing you can do to help is subscribe to our newsletter. You get kind of exclusive stuff in the newsletter, and it's written in a fun, informal way, hitting inboxes every week. It helps us out and keeps us talking Oklahoma State.